Hello and welcome to our podcast Hello Apollo our weekly podcast on health wellness and well-being I am your host Dr Karan Thakur Each week we take a health issue and discuss it in detail with our expert from the field to bring to you credible information to keep you healthy and safe And this week is no different I will be discussing an issue of great importance to anybody who's had any sort of cardiac illness and the subject of today's discussion is TAVI and TAVAR and to decode this I am delighted to be joined by Dr Vivek Kumar senior consultant cardiology at Indraprastha Apollo Hospitals Dr Vivek welcome to the podcast uh thank you very much Dr Karan it's a real pleasure to interact with you and with the uh, audience here and uh, you know uh, dr vivek is an expert uh, not just in the field of cardiology broadly but also in newer interventions so i'm delighted to have him with us um, dr vivek um, you know our subject of today's discussion is tavi and tavar and it is a bit of an alphabet soup could you just uh, decode for us what is tavi and what is tavar uh dr karan uh, definitely it's, it's a very pertinent question because tavi tavar what it means a lot of people are still confused are they same or not but uh, before i go to your question i would like to just uh, highlight you what tavi and tavar is part of so uh, tavi and tavar is part of a real new realm in interventional cardiology uh, which we call uh, structural heart disease intervention or trans catheter for valvular disease so uh, it was something like a unmet need that has been uh, fulfilled by the uh, expansion expansion in the medical technology and its real utility in, uh, to the patient so uh, trans catheter intervention de- so we know that we are not uh, an aging population and there are a lot of patients with symptoms uh, who are uh, who are don't get a surgery for their valve disease Uh, because of their comorbidities and other issues so this technology has come for such uh, needed patients so trans catheter intervention is a boon for such patients who need a valve intervention but they may be not a good candidate for surgical intervention so, so sorry uh, sorry just to come in here Yeah. that's a very interesting uh, elaboration of it uh, just wanted to ask you 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 spoke about structural heart disease so for our benefit of our listeners what what does that mean uh, dr vivek so broadly as you know that our heart has four chambers and uh, the right sa- chamber is uh, basically deals with the deoxygenated blood or the blood impure blood in layman term that comes from the body to the heart it is pumped into the lungs and it get purified or oxygenated in the lungs and then it goes to the left side of the heart and from here it circulates all over the body so right and left side or ch- doctor vivek really? Are you there? This all is included in structural heart intervention. So, if somebody is having a valve problem, uh, and if we can do it, uh, treat it without any open heart surgery, this this is where structural heart intervention comes. Right, and uh, you spoke also about age. Uh, so obviously uh, the interventions that we're talking about tavi tavar is for people who are older is that correct yeah definitely to some extent or maybe i'll say a large extent dr karan so we must understand that uh, technology comes with uh, experience it refines itself it improves upon itself so i'll just give you a brief history about how it all started so thanks to dr trebier the first tavi was done in 2002 why was it needed it was a patient of severe aortic stenosis who had a uh, very advanced disease but unfortunately the patient was not an eligible candidate for open heart surgery 
why on open heart surgery was not el- uh, he was not eligible the reason was that uh, in in lot of patients the risk associated with the surgery is too much or we can say prohibitive so in that patient a uh, successful dabi was done and uh, this was initially used to be done in high risk patients prohibited uh, prohibitive risk patients and then we had uh, trials refinement of technology and we realized that tavi can also be done in intermediate risk patients now if you see the data and the status we have that we can have some eligible patients of uh, low risk also that a tavi can be offered age is an important factor and that factor is in consideration because the valve that we are using are tissue valves and they have a limited life so obviously age becomes an important determinant on deciding whether to offer this technology to a patient or not right and, and does this also uh, emerge as an option for younger patients because now we see uh, cardiac disease in people in their 30s sometimes even in their 20s Uh, so uh, would you recommend this or do you go in for a different intervention uh, dr karan i think uh, uh, as i said that we are using tissue valves uh, these tavi valves are basically tissue valves it can be porcine or bovine origin uh, so they have a sh- they have a life so most of these tissue valves start degenerating in 8 to 9 or 10 years so definitely by this logic we cannot offer this treatment for younger patients but yes if the patient is so much so risky that if we don't intervene and the patient is going to succumb to the disease in such case to case basis we can offer and in fact it has been done in younger patients also because you uh, it was at that moment saving life becomes important but for usual valvular heart disease patients still open heart surgery with a mechanical valve is what is recommended right and um, if a patient uh, were to come to you um, how do you work up that patient how do you uh, establish that this is a candidate for tavi or tava so for a patient uh, if you know any person who is listening uh, what is it that he or she can expect so there are uh, two components to it one is the clinical component and one uh, the other one is the investigation so the clinical component includes clinical examination and the symptoms symptoms are very important uh, the reason symptoms are important is that in a severe aortic stenosis patients if there is no symptom such patients don't have real immediate risk of mortality or morbidity so but when the patient starts developing developing symptoms then the natural history declines uh, very dramatically and on an average in a symptomatic patients of severe aortic stenosis they don't survive more than 1 3 to 5 years it all depends on the symptoms so if the patient is symptomatic clinically we find that there is a murmur in the aortic area we confirm it through an echocardiography we need to know whether the valve is severely stenotic or not so this is our initial clinical findings that uh, uh, identify a patient that it needs uh, an intervention so then comes patient's risk profiling what kind of a risk the patient is having so today if you ask me if the patient is young so example for for us young patient means less than 65 years so in those patients we feel find that the patient is having severe aortic stenosis ideally the patient should go for open heart surgery which we call saver that is surgical aortic valve replacement but if the patient is having is 65 years or plus or or the patient is ha- having high, high or intermediate risk of uh, surgery in that scenario we start discussing about the possibility of tower and if the patient agrees about the surgery about the procedure then the most vital investigation in the workup of tavi is getting a ct radiogram through a tavi protocol this is important because this investigation helps us to decide the access through which we are going to implant the valve and the type of valve that we are going to use as well as the size of the valve so this is how we usually work up for such patients and uh, what does the procedure actually entail so uh, uh, for the benefit of our listeners uh, what is it that we are going to be undergoing because people know bypass but uh, don't know too well about what this would be 
so uh, in a very simplistic term uh, or in words i would like to say that uh, doing tavi is like extension of angioplasty that we have been doing for long hmm. so first of all we have to have an access and uh, the most preferred access is the femoral arteries which are the main arteries in the groin alternatively if we don't have an ideal femoral artery we can have an alternate access by way of carotid artery or the axillary artery so this access is the route through which we are going to do the procedure then the next important part is uh, crossing the valve we cross it through a wire the way we cross a lesion in coronary angioplasty we put a wire in the heart across the valve and then uh, we dilate the valve to make a space for our new valve i mean the diseased valve needs to be dilated in most of the cases to make a space for our new valve and then the valve that is to be implanted it is taken over a catheter that's why we call it a trans catheter intervention okay. and these valves are usually of two types one is balloon expandable and the other one is self self expanding so balloon expandable means that it is mounted on a balloon and we have to take the um, valve at the aortic position we uh, optimize the position we confirm the position and we just have to inflate the balloon and this is how the uh, valve gets deployed uh, for the self expanding valves we don't have to use a balloon for deployment these are basically nitinol frame uh, valves so they have a memory so uh, so we just have to release that valve at the position of aortic uh, annulus after uh, confirming its accurate position and this is how the valve is deployed the beauty of this procedure is that that this procedure can be done in under local anesthesia we can talk to the patient all through the procedure and patient can be mobile after 4 to 5 hours of the procedure in ideal condition right. so you're saying that uh, that's the procedure time and typically uh, after the procedure has been done what is the length of stay in the hospital when do patients go home so uh, to this uh, very important aspect is that uh, this valve uh, is done under local anesthesia in most of the scenarios so if the patient doesn't have any other comorbidities or need for admission for some other issues in that scenario usually the icu stay is just for a day and uh, in ideal condition we can uh, the patient can be discharged in 2 to 3 days of the procedure right and if you compare this with uh, you know uh, 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 the bypass days or at least even the modern bypass surgical area uh, what is the difference yeah what is the difference so uh, for the surgical area definitely the it's done under uh, general anesthesia with a ventilator on and uh, definitely the patient may require at least one or two or three days of icu stay thereafter there is a long period of physiotherapy and rehabilitation uh, so usually the patient are there for 7 to 10 days in the hospital and thereafter there is a process of uh, rehabilitation that may last for a month dependent upon the patient's condition and if you talk about aortic stenosis so such patients are usually very fragile frail and uh, uh, having a lot of issues so usually they get longer so uh, right. uh, this really makes our patient up and going in a week so you're talking about 4 to 5 weeks of recovery versus 4 to 5 days of at least going back home and starting some basic routine yes. and uh, um, in your body of work since you've got so much experience in this field um, could you just share with us some insights about what is the impact on the quality of life do patients go back to their regular routine if they work or uh, you know go for walks uh, uh, how how does your life get uh, impacted uh, dr tarun i think it's it's a very uh, interesting question and a very uh, realistic question because you know uh, tavi is not a cheap procedure i mean uh, it's it's costlier than the surgical area so uh, the benefit that we are offering and it doesn't work for the patient it doesn't mean anything so believe me uh, one patient i'll share that uh, uh, we discharged the patient in 48 hours the reason was that the patient was shifted to the icu on the uh, on, on the day of the procedure and in the evening the patient insisted on going to the room and we shifted the room because the patient was totally fine and walking around and in the icu itself 
and the patient can walk around after 4 to 6 hours the procedure and the next day the patient is ready to go home i told her that okay you should be going easy at your home but after a week when she came and she told me that i am doing everything at home so okay. this this thing that gives to a patient and most importantly it saves the psychological stress of a open heart surgery so that gives a lot of confidence to the patient as well as the relatives because these are elderly people elderly patients and you know a lot of emotions and uh, insecurities are mental and physical insecurities are associated with uh, this illness so that is very reassuring to see patient confident and walking after the procedure that's great uh, and you spoke about the first intervention being done around 2002 uh, you also have uh, a body of work uh, now uh, under your belt and with very good uh, uh, outcomes i just want you to touch upon outcomes and complications uh, for people who are listening to this and are contemplating getting this uh, how have the outcomes been both globally and in your practice and number two any complications that we must be very frank and open about okay so uh, dr taran i think uh, whenever a procedure is discussed this is the most important discussion yes. uh, discussing the risks and benefits so uh, till now we have been talking about the benefits of the procedure hmm. what are the risks this this is a very important consideration so uh, it's a trans catheter intervention with a minimally invasive uh, nature where we have a percutaneous uh, access to the vessel we have to go across major blood vessels and reach the heart we have to put in a stiff wire inside and uh, take in a bulky catheter which is usually uh, the dimension is about uh, 6 6 6 7 mm in width take into the vessels so uh, if you ask me what complications can happen so what complications can happen is the most common complication that we in encom- the rate of complications have really decreased if you if i talk about talk about the bleeding issues uh, since we are totally guided by the ct uh, imaging so whenever we start a procedure believe me we have plan a b c ready so we anticipate the complication beforehand and we are ready to tackle it so with a very precise planning most of the time these procedures are safe to undergo and uh, most of the complications can be minimized to less than 1% one issue that is uh, that is significant with uh, this technology is the need for a pacemaker hmm. so just to take a few minutes of you briefly this valve uh, the aortic valve lies very near to av node and his bundle so this is basically the relay station of our heart's electrical system electrical conduction system and we are going to deploy that valve at near to that place so numerically we have a higher risk of need for pacemaker after the procedure so in a normal surgical avr the risk may be 1 to 3% but for a tabi patient the need may be about 5 to 10% so it's not should be taken as a risk of the procedure it should be taken as a part of the procedure that about 5 to 10% patients can need a pacemaker after the implantation of tabi valve right so so that is a bleeding you know these uh, um, uh, issues need to be taken care of uh, we just drawing our conversation this very interesting conversation to a close but as we go uh, what advice would you give to a person uh, who has been advised Uh, to undergo one of these uh, 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 interventions uh, how should they make their mind up uh, if if they were to come to you and still in a dilemma uh, what is it that you tell them so uh, i am very uh, transparent whenever i am discussing this uh, treatment with a patient i encourage the patient to do the search search about the disease search about the procedure because it's very important to be on the same page 
so i will say that whenever you have somebody has been diagnosed with this problem uh, he should really educate himself and he should have a list of questions for the treating doctor i am very forthcoming for these questions every aspect of it whether it's bleeding or any other risk uh, should be discussed very frankly uh, in terms methodical way and definitely one should believe in this procedure uh, it may be costly it may look at the first instance that it's a costly procedure but if you uh cor- uh correlated for the long term benefits that it uh, confers so you will find that this procedure is worth going for right so that that was really uh, dr vivek because you are actually asking your patients to become informed patients uh, ask the questions uh, ask your doctor and be transparent about it um, and you so nicely explained to us uh, this uh, path breaking intervention which can save uh, so many lives so dr vivek kumar thank you so much for uh, joining this podcast episode and sharing your insights today it was a real pleasure dr taran and you have been a great host and uh, it was really really lovely to talk to you thank you likewise if you have any more questions for uh, dr vivek you would like to consult him uh, for yourself or for a loved one uh, please do reach out to us Uh, we will be very happy to set up an appointment with dr vivek kumar on this or on cardiology or any intervention that you need in cardiology uh, as a whole our uh, apollo delhi helplines are all open you can direct message us also on our digital platforms and we'd encourage your friends and family to listen to our podcast so do share this uh, with them we are available on all leading platforms remember good health is for everyone and so do join us next week as well when we will have another specialist from indraprastha apollo discussing another health issue of importance till then stay happy and healthy thank you thank you